Hey, what's up? It's the Tokyo Drifter, and thank you so much for joining me here on this platform. My work here at Chela TV is to make history and genealogy more accessible to Mexicanos and Chicanos all across the United States. Now, if you have seen my content on TikTok, YouTube, or even here on this platform, you will know that the colonial period, or what we call the colonial period, had a very big impact on our history. Now, in that period from 1519 to 1821, for many of us, that's just a big mystery. We actually skip past that part, right? You study about Mesoamerican history, you study about the Aztecs, you might learn about the conquest, and then you kind of skip past all that, and then you start learning about Mexican independence, and that's where you start to feel your Mexican nationalism kick in. Well, there's this big period of 300 years that's completely overlooked by most people, and in my opinion, that's where you're going to find the most information about your family history. So, why is this period important to you? Well, if you want to do serious research about your family during that period, you have to know how the government worked. I know sometimes when we think back to that period, we imagine conquistadors and lawlessness. Well, really, for much of that period, there was a system of laws and record keeping. And those documents still exist in historical archives all across Mexico. So let's break through a couple of myths about that period. First of all, was Mexico a colony of Spain? The answer might surprise you. It actually wasn't. I know we use that word colony to describe that period. I use that word sometimes, the colonial period. It, I use it interchangeably. But in the strictest legal sense, Mexico was not a colony of Spain. Well, so if Mexico wasn't a colony, what was it during this period? Well, when Mexico was part of the Spanish Empire, for much of that period, Mexico was a collection of kingdoms. Yes, that's right. Mexico was a collection of kingdoms for most of that period. There were some changes to that system in the mid-1700s, but I don't want to get ahead of myself. Let's talk about that period from 1519 all the way to the mid-1700s. In other words, Mexico was a collection of kingdoms that together formed the Viceroyalty of New Spain. Now, what's a Viceroyalty? A Viceroyalty is a legal jurisdiction that is overseen by a Viceroy. A Viceroy is essentially a representative of a monarchy. Believe it or not, even in modern times, there are similar political arrangements throughout the world. The best example is the British monarchy. Even in modern times, the British monarchy is still the head of the Commonwealth of Nations. And so a country like Canada, for example, that's also part of the Commonwealth. So the Queen of England, or now the King of England, he is also separately and simultaneously the King of Canada. And so in this arrangement, again, this is happening in modern times, Canada has what's called a Governor General, and the Governor General is in Canada to represent the interests of the British monarchy in Canada and to oversee the possession. And so even now, throughout the world, there are still other countries that we think of as independent countries that have a similar arrangement with the British monarchy. And Canada is not the only country in the world with this type of political arrangement. There's other countries that we think of as independent countries such as Australia or New Zealand or even Jamaica. Think about that. The King of England is also the King of Jamaica. So when we take a step back and we look at how these political arrangements worked back then and how they work now with these various European countries, you'll see that there's a lot of continuity and there's a lot of similarities in the way countries functioned. Of course, lots of things were different, but there's some ways we can apply today's lessons to back then. Now, keep in mind, this isn't to whitewash anything. My goal here is to make history more accessible. There are some lessons that we can learn from the modern world that can help us understand previous times. So if Mexico was a collection of kingdoms and, you know, there were kingdoms all throughout the Americas, who was the king in all, all of these kingdoms? Well, the king of these kingdoms was the king of Spain. And he was separately and simultaneously the king in each and every one of these kingdoms. So central Mexico, for example, the domain that was once part of the Aztec Empire, that was renamed El Reino de Mexico, the Kingdom of Mexico. Now, there was two legal ways that they would create kingdoms. One was for the local people to hand over their monarchy to the Spanish monarchy, which is what happened in the case with the Aztecs. Or you know, people would go out 
and form a kingdom. And that was the case with Nueva Galicia or New Galicia. And that was formed by um, Nuno de Guzman over there in Jalisco, uh, Nayarit, that area. Now, in the case with the Aztecs, and this is very central to Mexican history, and especially in the way Mexico became independent, when the Spaniards took over the Aztec domain, they renamed it El Reino de México. And they created the idea that that area was its own kingdom that was under the control of the Aztecs. And so at the time of the conquest, there was a transfer of power from the Aztecs to the Spanish monarchy. And the Spaniards also created the legal idea that that Aztec dominion was governed like its own monarchy in Aztec times. And just like in the same way European kingdoms that are defeated, how they could hand off their kingdoms to other kings, well, they viewed the transfer of power from Moctezuma and Guatemoc to the Spanish monarchy as a similar legal arrangement. And part of establishing this legal arrangement went like this. And so, as the story goes, Cortes was invited in to Tenochtitlan by Moctezuma. I don't think there's much dispute on that part of the story. But also, according to Cortes, Moctezuma handed over his empire to the Spanish monarchy while Cortes was in Tenochtitlan. Now, that was the first legal justification of this transfer of power. But that was also the basis for why the Spanish monarchy also recognized Aztec or Mexica nobility even after the conquest. The Spanish never saw Moctezuma as a renegade. And that's why, even after the conquest, the descendants of Moctezuma were still granted titles of nobility in the Spanish Empire. The descendants of Moctezuma still live in Spain today, and they still have titles of nobility, and they're still recognized by the Spanish monarchy as nobles. In fact, you could say the Spanish monarchy is the only institution in the world that still recognizes Aztec nobility. Think about that. So now, in this time period between 1519 and 1521, there were two very different factions within the Aztec leadership. There was one faction that supported cooperation with the Spaniards, and that was the Moctezuma faction. But there was another faction, the faction that ended up backing Guatemoc to succeed Moctezuma. Now that is the faction of the Aztecs that chose to resist, and those are the ones that went on to become national heroes in Mexican history. The, you know, the people behind Guatemoc in his last stand in Tenochtitlan. And so that faction surrendered with the surrender of Guatemoc on August 13th, 1521. And after that date, there wasn't really a serious, um, you know, challenge to, to Spanish rule by the Aztecs. And so after that date, that August 13th date in 1521, the Spaniards actually put the Moctezuma faction back into power. But of course, these were pro-Spanish Aztecs, if you will. The faction behind Guatemoc, well, they were slowly pushed out of history. Well, still, what happened to the Aztecs? Well, did you know that for the next 300 years, there was still an Aztec government in what is today Mexico City? So there was a you know Mexico City government that was run by Spaniards, but they also had a separate indigenous government for indigenous Mexica or Aztecs that lived in that area. And again, this government, San Juan Tenochtitlan, continued to exist for the next 300 years. And it was actually the Mexican government that abolished that government permanently. That government, San Juan Tenochtitlan, that had its own Aztec or Mexica governors, that government ceased to exist in 1824 with the passage of Mexico's first constitution, the Constitution of 1824 that created the Republic. And so aside from this government, this Reino de Mexico that you know, was carved out of central Mexico and was part of this viceroyalty of New Spain. There were other kingdoms, such as the kingdom of Nueva Galicia, that was carved out around Jalisco and Nayarit and, uh, and Colima. And that kingdom had no pre-colonial legal basis to work on. It was essentially a conquest and, um, you know, and it was carved out of the map. But over the next 300 years, from the 1500s all the way up until the 1700s and, you know, up until an independence, this Nueva España government continued to grow. It continued to add new kingdoms that were being created over time, new territories, until eventually it became, you know, much of North America. And when Mexico became independent, 
it claimed to be, and this is also in the Constitution of 1824, it claimed to be the successor government of Nueva España. It does not mention the Aztec Empire in there. It mentions that it is the successor, or it claims the possession of the territories of Nueva España. So I think that's enough for today, and I think a lot of people are kind of new to this type of history. Uh, but you know, you know, we'll continue to have conversations like this, and we'll cover other tidbits of history to help you get more acquainted with that period as you research your own family history. Alrighty, talk to you later.